Welcome back to the sixth session of Morrison Forster's and Nucleate's Advanced Topics in Patent Law course. We hope that you're finding these sessions helpful and look forward to continuing this, these discussions over the next few weeks. Today's session, we're going to focus on patent and FDA strategies for new drugs, which will be led by Morrison Forster partner Lisa Silverman and of counsel Bridget Bondock. Uh, before we start, a few housekeeping items. Uh, please use the Q&A feature on the Zoom screen if you have questions, and we'll do our best to get those questions answered. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the Q&A feature or send an email to Nora Moore at nmore at mofo.com. Uh, the recordings will be available. Look for an email um, uh, tomorrow, and we'll um, have the materials available as well. Um, and keep in mind that Morrison Forrester continues to hire. We're actively recruiting patent agents and scientific analysts. If you're at all interested, please reach out to us. A number of you have asked for office hours, which is great. And uh, those will be still offered throughout the course. So if you're interested in meeting with a MOFO patent attorney or agent to discuss careers here or to discuss your startup or any other IP or business questions or legal questions you may have, please reach out to us. With that, turn it over to Lisa and Bridget. Thanks, Mike. Um, we'll just, in the interest of time, jump right into the presentation. Um, I'm gonna advance the next slide. Um, so what's so special about pharma patents? Because this is a little bit of a unique animal compared to other technology industries. Um, so patents in the pharma space often can't be practiced until well after the filing or issuance because of FDA regulatory requirements, um, because you have to have the drug approved before you can actually practice what the patent is doing. Um, this holds for the uh, brand name drug companies, but likewise the competitors, the generics also have regulatory roadblocks to practicing the invention. Um, in the pharma space, patents tend to be most valuable at the end of their term. Um, that's when you're making the most money on the drug. So uh, making any extensions of term that you can get really important. Um, to that end, there is a pharma specific regime for term extensions called patent term extension in the US. And we'll talk more about that. Um, there's also a regime for listing patents in a registry um, called the Orange Book, at least for small molecule drugs, and there's other types of registries that Bridget will also talk about for other types of drugs. Um, and that gives certain benefits and invokes certain procedures involving generics trying to get on the market. And then in addition to patent uh, exclusivities, there's also a complementary regime of regulatory exclusivities. So, you know, really looking at both of these trajectories to assess the total protection for the product. Next slide. So um, thinking about patent lifecycle management, um, often it's beneficial to have more than one patent covering a, a drug or drug product. So typically your composition of matter patent coverage, that's the gold standard value for protecting the drug covers the compound or itself. Um, that's often obtained early on in the drug development process, years before approval. And so extensions of term due to PTA, which we'll talk about in PTE, which we'll also talk about, can be extremely valuable. But there's additional protection that can be obtained with later expiration. And that can be based on a number of factors, including new uses, new forms and formulations, new dosage forms, new combination therapies, um, companion diagnostics, clinical data. There's all kinds of ways to get follow-on coverage to expand the patent life. Next slide. So let's talk about the first type of extension of patents, and this is called patent term adjustment. So this is a procedure through the US Patent Office where you can get additional term at the end of your patent to compensate for delays in issuance of the patent by the Patent Office. So effectively, you know, for take, because if the Patent Office takes too long to issue you a patent, you can get additional term at the end to compensate. So this can be very valuable. Um, so when you're pat prosecuting your patent applications, there are a number of ways as the applicant that you can maximize your uh, potential to get this PTA, this additional term. 
Um, one is to um, avoid any delays on the part of the applicant, which would tend to negate the, the available um, patent term adjustment. So filing all your responses on time, filing any additional papers at appropriate times together with your office action responses um, so that you are not delaying the process in any way. Um, there's also ways of maximizing your likelihood of getting this patent office delay um, by taking as much time as you can for certain actions up until the date by which you would start accruing applicant delay. Um, so certain kinds of responses, you can take a certain amount of extension to expand the, the time in the patent office without getting this applicant delay. Next slide. Um, another way to maximize your term is to be very mindful of what's called obviousness type double patenting. So this is um, a, a, an unjustified extension of patent exclusivity beyond the term of a patent, essentially when two patents um, exist, one of which has claims that are an obvious variation of the claims of the other one um, that's impermissible. Um, that can be overcome by filing what's called a terminal disclaimer, but terminal disclaimers can help, can serve to erode any patent term adjustment that may be available. Um, and so there are strategies to address double patenting and to try to minimize um, this erosion of, of PTA. Um, some of these specific strategies include, you know, presenting all of your possible claim types in the first application in your patent family to try to get a restriction requirement um, and making sure that your subsequent divisional applications stay consistent with that re restriction requirement um, and to otherwise try to, in your follow-on applications, um, pursue claims that are patentably distinct from the, the patents that you already have so that you don't have this obviousness type double patenting problem. Next slide. So there's another main type of extension, which is called patent term extension, PTE. So this is under um, 35 USC 156, um, which um, was added uh, in, in 1984 as part of the Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act, is sometimes known as the Hatch-Waxman Hatch Act. You may have heard of that. And this provides additional term to compensate for regulatory delays in marketing the patent product. So it, uh, essentially trying to make up for the fact that you lose an effective part of your patent term because your product is still being evaluated by the FDA. So this is available for a broad range of FDA re regulated products, including small molecule pharmaceuticals, biologics, animal drugs, um, and class three medical devices that are approved under the PMA pathway. Next slide. So how do you become eligible for this PTE? Um, you have to have a patent that claims the product, the method of using the product, or a method of manufacturing the product. The patent has to not be expired. It has to never have been extended before. Uh, the application has to be made by the, the owner of record or its agent. Um, the product has to have been subject to one of those types of regulatory review periods. Um, and it must be, this is important, for the first permitted commercial marketing or use. So if the product was previously approved for a different indication, then it's not eligible for PTE. Um, next slide. So how do you calculate this patent term extension? So first of all, um, you have to have a patent that's issued before you can start accruing this extension term. So starting from the patent issue date, um, you get what amounts to half of the testing phase, which is from your IND to your NDA or BLA or whatever your, your application for approval is, you get half those number of days plus the total number of days from your NDA, BLA, PMA um, up until your approval date. This is subject to certain caps. Um, so you cannot get more than five years of total term added to the end of your patent. Um, and there's also a cap where your extension cannot take your patent term out more than 14 years from your approval date. 
Um, but this can be extremely valuable to give you up to five years of additional term on one patent covering your product. Next slide. So what patents are eligible for PTE? As I mentioned before, they have to claim a product, a method of using the product or a method of manufacturing the product. It's not available for a patent that covers only a metabolite, um, even if the approved product would infringe the metabolite patent. Um, and, and procedurally, you can file a patent term extension application for multiple different patents. Um, it takes about two to three years for the patent office to fully process and approve your PTE application. Um, so you can file on multiple patents, but ultimately at the very end of the process, you would need to elect a single patent to, to, to get the extension. Um, next slide. So what does the extension get you? It's not a complete extension of the patent for, for all that it claims. It is a limited extension. So if, the extend, if the claims are directed to the product, um, the extension is for any use approved for the product. Um, and if the patent is broader, it, it encompasses more than one chemical compound, a genus of compounds, it's only extended to the extent it covers the uses of the approved product. Um, if it's a method of use claim, it's any claimed use that's approved for the product. And if it's a method of manufacture claim, the extension applies to the method the claimed method as used to make the approved product. Next slide. So there are ways you can plan for patent term extension years in advance to try to maximize the amount of, of PTE that you will get. And you know, given how valuable it is, it's worth thinking about these things early on. So first of all, as I mentioned, you only accrue PTE um, from after the issuance date of your patent. So it's important to obtain early issuance of key composition of matter patents. You can file direct US applications rather than waiting to enter the US via the PCT national phase. You can even consider track one expedited filings to try to get a patent as quickly as possible. And it can be helpful to aim for issuance of a patent prior to or concurrent with your IND filing. Um, you can try to expedite prosecution as well by pursuing narrow, maximally defensible claims in the first U.S. application of the family that might help you to get the patent issued uh, sooner and then also give you that, that strong foundational patent for PTE as a, as a real um, rock solid patent that you can enforce later on in, in litigation. Um, and if a patent family covers multiple clin clinical candidates, you can consider having, you know, different applications within the family claim the different compounds that are, that are of interest so that you can have opportunities for separate PTE patents for each of your clinical candidates. Next slide. There is an interplay between PTE and double patenting. Um, which I mentioned before about double patenting. So um, terminally disclaimed patents, um, so patents that had a double patenting issue, but that was overcome by filing a terminal disclaimer, those patents are still eligible for PTE. Um, the PTE just attaches to the end of the patent term as subject to the terminal disclaimer. But um, an important note to be aware of is that the terminal disclaimer can only cure an, a, a double patenting problem if the reference patent has not yet expired. So it is sometimes possible if a double patenting issue comes up in, in patent litigation that you can fix it by filing a terminal disclaimer, um, but you, you can't do that if the reference patent is, has, has already expired. Um, you know, so if you're enforcing your patent during the PTE period, um, you may not be able to avail yourself of, of this method of, of overcoming the litigation challenge. So um, be careful about assessing potential for double patenting challenges. Um, consider filing precautionary terminal disclaimers sometimes in patents with, with PTE. And be very cautious about allowing patents to lapse after issuance in case they become an issue for, for double patenting later on. Next slide. Um, and I think I will turn this over to uh, Bridget to talk about the Orange Book and other, other things. <laughs> 
Great. Great. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks, Mike. Um, so just to talk a little bit about FDA's role in this process, um, drugs that are approved under the new drug application process, usually referred to as NDAs, this is where you see most small molecule drugs, uh, you have uh, a reference book that is compiled by FDA. It actually used to be a big, heavy book, and we used to fight over it in the law library, but now it's all online and searchable on FDA's website. Um, and what that orange book contains is a listing of all patents covering the drug substance, the drug product, or an approved method of using the drug. And in order for a generic to be approved, the generic manufacturer has to certify that they won't launch their generic until after the expiration of the orange book listed patent. Um, and, um, or they have to certify that the patent's invalid, unenforceable, or that the generic product will not infringe the listed patent. And I'll hit on that again later. Um, it's important to have coordination between the patent and regulatory teams to ensure that you have alignment of claim language with the FDA label. Um, and that's gonna be especially important for method of use patents. Next slide, please. And uh, there are requirements for the applicant to, or the, the holder of the NDA, this is what happens when the applicant receives approval from FDA, they become an NDA holder. They must submit information to FDA regarding any patent that claims the drug, I'm sorry, which claims the drug for which the applicant submitted the application, claims of method of using such drug, and with respect to a claim of uh, which, uh, <laughs> Excuse me, claim to which a patent, a claim of patent infringement could reasonably be asserted if a person not licensed by the owner engaged in the manufacturer use or sale of the drug. So in other words, does the scope of the claim uh, cover the same, same subject matter and then whether or not the patent itself is valid or enforceable? Next slide, please. Um, so that's that was what the statute says. FDA's regulations uh, have a little bit of a... Um, a bit more detail. Some, some, you know, some, some may say that there's there's a difference. Um, an NDA holder must submit um, information about patents regarding the active ingredient, uh, formulation, and composition, and then also method of use patents. So there's some overlap, but they get a little more specific about um, whether to submit. Uh, certain types of patents and not others. So for example, patents claiming methods of making intermediates and packaging are not listable. Next slide, please. So uh, for method of use claims, the applicant uh, has to certify that the patent claims an approved method of use of the approved drug product. So is there alignment between the indication that FDA has approved in the drug's labeling and the patent claim? Uh, and then you have to identify the use, again, with specific reference to the approved labeling. So not only is it a use of the approved drug product, but is it the same as the one on the label? And FDA is very particular about that. Um, things that you may think are the same uh, actually are not as a, as a matter of FDA's judgment. So it's very important to get a good read on that, either from the agency or from your counsel. Um, and then you also have to submit a description of the approved indication or method of use um, in, in order to have that included in the as a use code in the orange book. So you can go through all of these use codes that are listed and it will give you different um, different indications. So for example, if you uh, had a drug that was for the treatment of migraines, they would have a, uh, a code that's specifically associated with that indication. Um, and you have to identify each type of use. So a drug can have more than one type of use. And so you're gonna have use codes associated with every indication that gets approved for a drug. And those can be added on over time. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's good to have uh, a good amount of detail in those use codes so that you can ensure that you have uh, the coverage that uh, if some generic comes later, that if, if when they're looking at the use codes, they'll they'll know that their particular indication is is already covered. Next slide, please. 
So uh, we should also talk a little bit about the purple book, although the purple book is not nearly as uh, critical as the orange book at this phase, um, but I expect that to change in the future. I think it's kind of ironic. The um, biologics are probably some of our oldest medicines, but they um, have a little bit of a less built out regulatory regime. Um, I, so there are many books that FDA compiles. So you have the orange book, you have the purple book, you even have the green book, which I'll mention later uh, that discusses animal drugs. But the purple book provides information about biologics that have been licensed by FDA, including biosimilars and interchangeables. Next slide, please. By statute, the purple book must include any exclusivity period for a biologic or a first interchangeable, only if FDA has determined eligibility. And even for interchangeables, this only applies if the period has not already concluded. Uh, FDA is not obligated to make these determinations in the first place, so it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting rule. You have to include it if you've already determined it, but if you haven't determined it, you don't have to put it in. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a quick brief overview slide comparing the information that's required to be provided for the orange book to the purple book. Um, I don't intend to go over this in any great detail, but it's more for your reference later. Um, but I'll just mention again that the green book is probably closer to the orange book in terms of its structure and requirements. Um, and then there is no corollary on the animal side for uh, animal uh, or veterinary biologics because those are regulated by USDA and they don't have the same exclusivities. Next slide, please. So this is this is kind of the 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 uh, slide, if I were only going to give this presentation giving one slide, this is the slide that I would use. Um, it compares the re FDA regulatory exclusivities for small molecule drugs uh, to those for biologics. And as I was mentioning earlier, biologics, their scheme is just a little bit less built out. There just aren't as many types of exclusivity associated with biologics. Um, that said, um, the, the exclusivity period for biologics is quite a bit longer, which we'll talk about more uh, shortly. Uh, but the, the one thing I just want to point out in this slide is that these the highlighted square at the bottom, it, the, there's, there's exclusivities that can only apply once and that's all you get. But there are other exclusivities where they extend the existing exclusivity, so they add on to the end. And so if you can get something adding on to the end of a five-year exclusivity period or a 12-year exclusivity period in the case of a biologic, that's really beneficial. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk first about new chemical entity exclusivity. This is probably the most well-known uh, exclusivity periods for five years. Uh, it's provided for under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Uh, FDA can accept earlier generic applications if there's a paragraph four certification. Uh, otherwise, FDA is not allowed to accept uh, an application any earlier than four years after the that new chemical entity was approved. Um, but please note that acceptance of an application is not the same thing as approval. And so if the generic applicant gets caught up in um, you know, the vicissitudes of an F FDA review, it could be some time beyond the five-year exclusivity period that the uh, generic actually gets approved. Next slide, please. Here's um, just a little more detail about what happens when a generic applicant files a paragraph four certification. Um, basically, it lays out the timing and incentives for both parties. Um, I won't go into this in, in you know, minute detail, but I think that it's worth it's worth pointing out that the infringement suit can actually result in uh, the the innovator receiving a 7.5, seven and a half year term of uh, NCAE exclusivity rather than just the original five. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about skinny labeling. Um, it's a cute name for an approach that some generic applicants have taken where there are expired composition of matter patents, but method of use patents that only cover some subset of the approved uh, indications that remain listed. So successful carve out avoidance strategies are formed early and revisited often in order to develop patents with a, a term that's gonna last at least seven and a half years from approval. 
that cover the composition of mat matter, or they have method of use claims that span all of the approved indications. So if, just to use a quick example, um, if say I had a drug that, that treated migraines, but the um, composition of matter patent ran out on that drug and you didn't have any FDA exclusivities left for that indication, but you did have um, another indication that was newer that for which you had uh, the, uh, the clinical data exclusivity, which we'll talk about in just a minute, that's a three-year exclusivity period, then the generic applicant might be able to, to narrow their application sufficiently that they cover the indication that is no longer covered by a patent and no longer covered by an FDA exclusivity period, and they don't, they don't infringe on the, on the other uh, indication. And so um, it's been the subject of recent litigation. And I, I think we're not yet to the point yet where we can say there's been a definitive decision on whether the labeling carve out or skinny labeling approach is viable as a general matter. And sorry, that was for the next slide. So just pointing out a case where that has been discussed. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, the GSK v. Teva decided in uh, 2020. And basically, the court there is declining to, to, you know, state a rule. It's more that they are saying it's 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 a fact specific determination. Next slide, please. Okay, so clinical investigation exclusivity, which I just mentioned, it's sometimes referred to three-year exclusivity or data exclusivity. It's based on data from new clinical, a new clinical investigation that's sponsored or conducted by the applicant and was also essential to the approval of that new formulation or new indication. And it's 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 a relative it's it's a relatively limited um, use. I, I find that you know you do add on new indications and you do get this three year exclusivity at times. But I think that um, it's a it's a less used exclusivity period. Next slide, please. So biologics exclusivity is for twelve years and prevents approval of a biosimilar interchangeable product within that time frame. However, the applications, as you saw on the NCE side, new chemical entity side, uh, applications can be submitted four years after the reference product was licensed. But there's eight years that the agency has to review the application generally if, if they do submit it that early before the 12 year exclusivity period runs out. Next slide, please. So this slide gives a brief overview of what the approval process looks like for a biosimilar or interchangeable product. All these things have to happen first. <laughs> and that's what gets you to year 12. You, you have to have an approval. So that's the first date of licensure. Um, at four years, uh, you can file as a biosimilar. Uh, and then you go through the litigation period if there's any you know challenges to the patents and infringement. And then, at year 12, FDA can finally approve a, a, a biosimilar or an interchangeable. Next slide, please. So what is a reference product? This, this slide is mostly here for, for later reference, but it's, um, it's, it's a licensed biologic product um, against which a proposed biosimilar product is compared. And so if you took it, and compared it to the small molecule regime, you would say that you've got a new chemical entity and then a generic. Um, some of the other words that we use to describe this, these categories are like um, innovator, generic, or brand name, generic. Um, it, it's biosimilars can, can, are, are kind of the, the generic of the, of the biologics world. Um, importantly, they're sometimes referred to as 351A for the reference product and 351K for a biosimilar. And um, the, the qualifications for coming in under the biosimilar application, which is less onerous, uh, or supposed to be at least, less onerous than the original licensing application is that there is um, has to be a high degree of similarity and there's no clinically meaningful differences in terms of safety, purity, and potency. Next slide, please. 
And uh, just pointing out the statutory provision that points out the exclusivity period and when, when the generic applicant can turn in their application. Um, the date of first licensure, uh, you would think is relatively straightforward. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, it is relatively straightforward, but there are a few exceptions, um, which the slide does not make it look like there are a few, but basically if there is a non-structural change where you don't have um, a, a real, ch you know, a change to the, to the actual biologic, but you're instead doing something like a new indication, route of administration, dosing schedule, uh, something like that, that's not going to get you... Um, uh, RPE, and neither is a structural modification that doesn't change the safety purity or potency. And, um, and I think, you know, I think you would add in a clinically meaningful way, although that's not something that is, is determined. Um, one other category that I've, I've actually seen somebody try to bring up before are transitional or deemed biologics. Um, when FDA used to regulate proteins under the the small molecule pathway, they actually um, received NDAs instead of BLAs, and FDA uh, was ordered by Congress to move those proteins over to the biologics licensing side of things within 10 years, and that was just recently completed in the last two years. That licensing process also does not count as a data first licensure. Next slide, please. Um, this is how you use the purple book. This is a purple book entry um, for Prevnar, and it gives you the original approval date and the date of first licensure. So if you're looking for that information as a biosimilar applicant, that's where you find it. And next slide, please. Um, one of the things that uh, FDA has pointed out in recent guidance is that there can be a a threat to your exclusivity if you um, file separately from uh, another entity where you've been affiliated with your with respect to developing the product. Um, so it's a a fact specific inquiry. FDA says it uses factors like certain commercial collaborations and the level of collaboration between the entities, um, but it's. It's draft guidance, and I don't I don't know if it is has been used a whole lot yet, just because we we haven't had many opportunities to see it play out in public. Um, and it, I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and move on to the to the next slide. It's 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 on the same topic. Um, you know, as I noticed on the slide in the the date that first licensure was discussed. Um, those structural modifications may not be eligible for RPE, um, but the guidance says if you can show that there is a demonstration in in the change in of sorry a, a change in the purity, safety, or potency of the product, if you can demonstrate that, then there may there may actually be RPE eligibility. Um, that that text here is is probably too long for that that point. Um, but the, again, this is from draft guidance that FDA issued in 2014. It hasn't been finalized yet. Um, often a sign that they're having some difficulties applying the guidance in, in practice. So we may see some significant changes given how long the guidance has been in draft. Next slide, please. Finally, sorry about that. <laughs> the interchangeable um, biosimilars, they have a special uh, RPE period. Um, if they've rece received a determination of interchangeability for any condition of use, FDA can't license another product as interchangeable uh, for in, until the earlier of either one year after the first commercial marketing of the first interchangeable biosimilar, 18 months after a final court decision all patent, on all patents in suit, um, or, or for the dismissal of such a suit or 42 months after approval of the first interchangeable biosimilar if the applicant has been sued under a certain provision and such litigation is ongoing. There's just a lot of rules that you can apply, if then rules that you can apply where you have interchangeable biosimilar RPE. I think that might be my last one before Lisa gets to take back over. <laughs> 
Oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, how am I doing on time, Mike? You're good. You're okay, 4, great. 435. Yeah. And we'll take, let's do some questions after you finish and before Lisa jumps in. Great. I, I added a whole bunch of slides to the presentation. Um, and so I'm nervous about having enough time to get through all of them. The um, the orphan drug exclusivity is actually a really nice um, way that Congress has incentivized drug manufacturers to focus on uh, diseases that affect fewer than 200,000 patients in the U.S. annually or that are unlikely to recover research development costs. So it's a <coughs> excuse me, it's it's a way to to get more investment focused on those um, less uh less common diseases where the drug companies don't feel like they're going to make quite as much money um so orphan exclusivity can add on to the end of your original exclusivity period and it can apply for both drugs and for biologics and it's seven years long which is great um they can't approve any other such dr drug for such disease or condition those words cause so many problems um we have a lot of clients come to us and ask such disease is this the same disease as this other you know um, orphan drug candidate got exclusivity for or not um, how specific do you have to be how broad of an indication can you have um, <clears throat> so there are exceptions however because fda's and Congress's goal was to have availability of the drug and treatment for these rare diseases um, if you can't assure sufficient quantities of the drug, or if the person who's uh, the manufacturer of the orphan drug consents, <coughs> excuse me, to the approval of other applications before their orphan drug exclusivity expires. Um, <clears throat> so for biologics, that seven year exclusivity period can, you know, take you out to 19 19 years um, and you can have multiple different orphan designations so if you can see pe pediatric Crohn's juvenile re rheumatoid arthritis this is all for um, I think it's Humira adalimumab um, so these pediatric indications are often one way that the um, applicant can narrow down the focus of their indication to get to the orphan qualification next slide please <clears throat> so <clears throat> clinical superiority um, is another qualification if you can if you can if you can show clinical superiority then somebody else or sorry if the if the competitor can come in and show clinical superiority then you are no longer entitled to your exclusivity period uh, <clears throat> That, that was the argument, but the um, the court actually held in that case that that clinical superiority is is not a requirement in the statute. And so it, even though there was a second drug that was clinically superior, it just wasn't part of the the um, with it wasn't within FDA's authority to make that determination. <clears throat> so next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about six months pediatric exclusivity. So uh, there are uh, studies that FDA would like for manufacturers to conduct on, because so many drugs get used off label for peds, they don't um, often get much clinical testing. This is a way for uh, investment to be encouraged in those pediatric studies. So when FDA gives an approval letter for a drug, they'll have this addendum at the end and it'll say something like, and if you conduct this, this, and this study, we'll tack six more months on to the end of your either new clinical entity exclusivity or your biologics exclusivity. It's a written request process. It's super formal, but very straightforward. Drug companies are very used to it, but um, that six months doesn't seem very long, but it can be, uh, because it tacks on to the end, it can be highly valuable monetarily. Uh, next, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
And I don't know if I want to go into detail on this one, but um, again, such drug um, does a pediatric indication. I think this is actually a goes back to the Orphan Drug Act. Um, another administrative lawsuit. You had um, two two companies where uh, one had orphan exclusivity for limbs and adults, and then FDA approved another drug for the same disease in pediatric patients, um, and the the, you know, the first approval argued that FDA should have never approved the, the second drug. And the court agreed um, FDA violated the Orphan Drug Act. And so the, is this pediatric indication um, enough for, for the orphan drug to apply not just to the original um, to the original indication in just adults, if, if you if you drill down and use the pediatric indication, like I was talking about earlier, there there is at least one court that has said you can't do that. Um, so yeah, it could it can apply in both the situation of a regular drug, small small molecule, or a biologic. So the the orphan drug rules are pretty pretty set in stone, and the and the court doesn't give FDA a lot of wiggle room there, but sometimes the competitors don't don't fight about it. Next slide. Oh, so this is just a, an a indication of what happened in the orange book and on the orphan drug marketing page. Um, and so what, what may be happening now as a result of the 11th Circuit decision uh, is that FDA's approval of that drug may be withdrawn. They may have to wait until the end of the orphan drug period for the catalyst drug. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that, thank you for your patience, everybody. That, that's all of the, the FDA slides. Okay, Lisa, why don't we take on a few of these questions. Ethan has a question about composition of matter patents and how they may expire before a method of use patents, you know, for a specific indication for the drug. And compa matter is preferred over method of use, but in these cases, where, where, you know, talk about, you know, extending exclusivity, you know, with PTE for method of use versus the composition of matter. Yeah, and, and it, that's a great question. That's actually the subject of some of the, the slides that are coming up. Um, so I can either answer it now, but why don't we hold yeah, on? Why don't we, yeah, why don't we, we get, get good preview? Super. Um, one, Paul has a question about changing in an amino acid sequence. Is there a way to patent something that has one or more of the amino acids there, or is there some rule for percent similarity to maintain coverage? So I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Um, the courts have been cracking down more recently on getting super broad coverage that would just cover, you know, any antibody to X target. Um, you used to be able to get some of those incredibly broad claims, and 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 that's no longer the case. Um, I can't say that there's a specific number, but it might depend on your ability to show. You know, if you have a range of amino acid sequences available, can you show in your patent application that across a certain range you would expect similar activity, or that you would, you know, you have sufficient data to show that um, a certain range of amino acids works and is fully enabled and described in your application? Great. So, Bridget, there's a question about seeking. FDA approval for a biological drug in multiple countries. So I guess it would be not FDA, but you know, just approval in multiple countries. You know, in US and outside the US. How, how does one go about doing that? You have it's a it's a country by country uh, situation. You usually uh, manufacturers will come to the United States first, um, just because the market here is is more um, lucrative. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, the EMA authorities, um, European Medicines Agency, the UK, um, there's usually a sort of a structured um, uh, timing for when um, manufacturers will go from one country to the next, depending on, you know, whether or not the drug is 
for a disease that's more prevalent in a certain, you know, country than another. Um, but usually FDA's approval carries a lot of weight with other um, authorities. And so sometimes you can carry an FDA approval over to another regulatory body and say, look, we got it, we got it through the FDA. It's surely it's safe enough for, for you. And that, that actually works out quite well in, in many cases. But there are differences um, in, in the various regulatory bodies. And, and USDA, or sorry, UF, FDA and the uh, EMA don't always agree. And there have been differences between FDA and the UK. So it's not a guarantee. Got it. So um, Lisa, why don't we pick up on your slides and we can come back to questions at the end. Okay, great. So now that you've had an intro to um, the FDA and the different exclusivities and the orange book, um, we'll come back, we want to come back to some, some patent strategies that can leverage those um, FDA related opportunities. So one thing is that it can be very beneficial to keep a patent application pending, especially in key patent families. So um, if you do end up in litigation, this will give you an ability to assert additional claims against future competitors, ability to get different claims if your existing patents are challenged during your ANDA litigation or in the patent office via you know, inter-parties review or post-grant review. But also in view of the orange book where Bridget talked about wanting to have alignment between your, your approved indication and your patent claims, um, keeping an application pending really maximizes your opportunity to be flexible and get additional claims that will align with your label indication. Next slide. So here's where we get to the question of which patent do you pick for your patent term extension? And this does also play into the, the orange book considerations in a big way, I think. So if you think about your composition of matter claims, um, those are often the first patent that you would look to. Um, those claims are listed in the orange book. So that gives you significant advantages in terms of um, you know, the ANDA litigation process. Um, the the um, extension is more extensive um, for a composition of matter claim. So the extension would apply to all approved uses, including any later approved uses. Um, whereas for a method of treatment claim, the extension would only apply to the claimed use you know, if it's approved. Um, the composition of matter claims are often less susceptible to section 112 challenges, meaning written description and enablement type challenges compared to use claims. So they can be stronger patent claims. Um, and if your composition of matter coverage will otherwise expire before the end of that and a 30 month stay, that can weigh in favor of extending the composition of matter patent. Because going back to what Bridget discussed about the carve out, um, if you're approved for multiple indications or if there's any possibility of a carve out of the method, um, that could kind of circumvent the, the um, ability to really take advantage of the full five years plus 30 month stay to get you seven and a half years of exclusivity. If you're thinking about different kinds of composition of matter claims, you might have a genus patent versus a species composition of matter patent. Um, so species claims may be less vulnerable to overall validity challenges because they're more specific. Um, and they also can be less vulnerable to these double patenting, obviousness type double patenting challenges, which could, as we discussed, have, can have, have impact on your patent term adjustment. Next slide. Method of use claims, um, these are also listed in the orange book. So extending them can also you know, be beneficial in taking advantage of the ANTA litigation process and getting to your you know, seven and a half years, um, assuming that you can't, there's no carve out available. Um, as the, I think the person who asked the question noted, they may provide a later expiration date that the composition of matter claims, especially if they're in a later filed patent family, um, on the flip side, because you don't start accruing uh, that additional time that would count towards your PTE, if it's from a later filed patent family, it probably issued later. And so your actual time accrued that you can add to the end of your patent may actually, actually be less than um, what you could add to your composition of matter case, even if the final 
extended expiration date would be longer than the expiration date if you got PTE on your composition of matter case. So there's a trade-off between the amount of PTE sometimes versus what is the ultimate extended, extended date. Um, Method of manufacture claims, um, these are probably the least common choice um, because they're relatively easy to design around. Um, you know, the, they can be more difficult to prove infringement if you're not, you know, you, you can't necessarily have full visibility into how another company is making the product. Um, these are not listed in the orange book, so they can't be the basis of that 30 month stay for, your, for the ANDA application. Um, you also might consider whether information kept as a trade secret is required to show that the claims read on the product. Again, the difficulty of proving infringement. Um, the one context where I would say, you know, it, it is slightly more common to see method of manufacture claims uh, selected for extension is for biologics, where manufacturing can be harder to replicate, and these orange book considerations really don't come into play because, as Bridget mentioned, the purple book for biologics doesn't really operate and have that same gravity of, you know, of informing the litigation process as the orange book does for small molecules. And Lisa, Next can I just back. add in one yeah. little thing? FDA always says for biologics, the, the product is the process. And so that totally makes sense that, that the manufacturing claims would be more important on the biologic side. Yeah. Uh, let's see, next slide. Um, so uh, I think this might be the final section, just wrapping up on thinking about um, due diligence context and considerations for all of these different pieces we're talking about. So what happens when you're in the due diligence process, um, either on the investor side or on the target side? Um, so investors and pharma partners are often most interested in the loss of exclusivity date. And they're not so concerned about whether this comes from the patents or if it comes from the regulatory exclusivities. They just want to know how long am I going to keep competitors off the market? So really understanding all of these types of exclusivities, the patent term, the ability to get extensions through PTE, the ability to get patent term adjustment, the ability to guard against losing term due to double patenting, as well as all stacking all the different regulatory exclusivities can be really helpful in understanding the, the full picture of, of the exclusivity profile for a product. Um, so you should consider, you know, when you consider the projected, you know, patent term extension and which patent it's expected to attach to, that should be considered in the context of all of these different exclusivities and, and what's going to be available. Um, when you're trying to, you know, present your product or your pipeline to a potential investor or pharma partner, you know, considering what the IND date is, what the NDA and the BLA dates and the potential approval dates are, even if speculative, can help to show, you know, how much PTE you might be able to have it makes your patent term, you know, longer and, and is more attractive to show that you would be able to get that additional term. And if you have multiple indications in clinical trials, it's important to consider which is expected to be the first approval, um, as this may impact which patents are available for PTE. Next slide, please. Um, you should also consider which patents will be listable in the orange book. So again, when you're um, you, when, when, when you're facing a potential investor or pharma partner to be able to explain which patents and how many patents you'll be able to get in the orange book can be, can be very effective. Um, and again, considering the double patenting families that could arise um, and, and what the impact of that is. Um, I don't know if there is a next slide. Is that, is that the end? That is the end. Um, and we still have six minutes left for questions. So there's a question on filing a brand new application for the exact approved label, even though the prior uh, composition of matter family is, is available as prior art. And I think it'd, it'd be helpful, Lisa, to answer this question with respect to sort of mining, you know, the, the clinical data as it comes in and how you how you take a look at that. Yeah, so, so as a general matter, right, as, as you probably know, um, a patent needs to, claims have to be novel and inventive in order to be patentable. And so if you have a brand new 
um, patent filing, you know, you have to make sure that whatever is being claimed there is novel and inventive over your earlier composition of matter case. And if your your you know indication or something similar to your approved indication is in your composition of matter case, it might be hard to get that later patent. But as Mike alluded to, um, there is a lot that can be mined out of clinical data. And so, um, you know, because an earlier application says you can treat cancer or even lung cancer, um, maybe it's discovered through clinical data in the clinical trials that a certain patient subpopulation is particularly helped by the drug, um, that a certain, um, you know, dosing regimen or way of administering the drug, you know, is, is, is really the most suitable. So, um, trying to figure out what are those pieces that have been discovered that are really unique and are maybe not directly in your composition of matter case and can be explained as being, you know, really new discoveries, you know, that's where you might have, have this kind of opportunity. Otherwise, this comes back to the keep an application pending strategy, which is if the indication is really in your composition of matter case, right, get that claim out of your composition of matter case. Maybe, Lisa, you could also speak to sort of the importance of trying to get claims that reflect the label on a, on a drug, you know, maybe for in, inducing infringement, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think the importance of getting the claims that match the label, um, you know, this is really most important, you know, um, I think if you're in the context where your composition of matter patent is either vulnerable or is expired, because you really want to make sure that you can keep competitors off the market um, and, and really take most advantage of those method of use patents to avoid carve outs and, uh, um, and, and leaving gaps in your coverage, you know, after your composition of matter patent expires. You also want to make sure that those method of use patents can actually be listed in the orange book. So if the, you know, your, your, your patent claims don't have to literally recite exactly what's on your label, um, and they don't have to be coextensive, right there. If you think about the Venn diagram of here's my patent claims and here's my um, label, right? You just want to make, you know, in order to be listable in the orange book, there needs to be some overlap between those two circles. It doesn't have to be coextensive. Um, but the more they match up, the more opportunities you have to, to leverage those patents to, to keep others um, out, of, out of the market for the longest time. Great. So Bridget, there's a question about EUA approvals of biologics and how it may affect an extension period, if at all. So the first thing is that uh, an EUA is authorized, it's not approved. And so uh, an EUA, so emergency use authorization is not entitled to any exclusivity uh, under the statute. And so there really isn't any uh, exclusivity period invoked during that time. Once a vaccine, so for example, community um, Pfizer um, does receive FDA approval, then you enter the, the traditional process that was discussed in the presentation. It's an interesting question. You would think that, you know, the product being on the market under the EUA would, would somehow affect these exclusivity periods, but it just doesn't. And Lisa, there's a question from Isabella on um, patentability, uh, biosimilars, and what you've seen with respect to sort of the most common issues. You know, is there any guaranteed path? I think if, if there was one, uh, we'd be out of business, but <laughs> you can explain that. Um, so on, on the biosimilars side, um, patentability for biosimilars. So, so um, are you thinking of, pat of, of whether the biosimilars company can get their own patents on their product? Because I think in that case, you know, there's really this needle to thread between, you know, in order to get approved as a biosimilar, you want to show that your product is as similar as possible to the approved um, reference drug. Um, on the other hand, you have to be somewhat different in, in some way to, to get, um, to get a, patent on something that, that arises later. 
Um, you know, I, I work a lot in the small molecule context, and one way that generic sometimes um, get their own patents in that context is by creating new salt forms or new solvates or new crystalline forms of a drug where um, essentially, you know, you can still piggyback on all of the clinical data from the reference listed drug, but just show that your different crystalline form or salt form is bioequivalent. Um, so, so I imagine, although it's, it's not exactly my area, but I imagine there's similar types of things that, that could happen in the biologic sphere as well. Okay. We're up against the hour. Thank you both Bridget and Lisa for great presentations. We'll see everyone next week. Thank you.